Um, so first of all, what is biosphere space? So as it says here, it's meant to be an interoperable Python framework for biomolecular simulation. So what it's meant to be basically the glue which holds together different simulation uh, engines and gives you a common interface that you can use to run them. So the idea is this should allow you to write reproducible workflows, which use different hardware, which use different software, different simulation engines. And also it hopefully lowers the barrier to using these different engines through the common interface. It's also really quite nice for running simulations in real time and interacting with them for Egyptian notebook. Uh, so next slide, please. So why should you be interested in alchemistry and alchemical methods? So I want to motivate that by first of all showing what you can get out of these methods. Yeah. So I'm just, just stand on the other side. Oh, the camera's over here. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. So what a, quite a valuable problem in early stage drug design is if we have a protein, we have some binder and we want to optimize the affinity of the binder. So shown here is an example with Paris and Venice 2. We have a ligand up in the top left, you might not be able to see it, and there is an R group in the top left of the molecule. And we want to know without synthesizing this, which is going to give us the greatest binding affinity. So which R group should we use? And we don't want to waste time in the lab making pro binders. So this is a perfect candidate problem for a relative binding affinity calculation. And the idea is that what this should be able to give you is the output which is shown on the right, which is the predicted delta G bind on the left uh, and underneath the experimental delta G bind. And hopefully you can see there's really pretty good correlation between the two here, which means that in this case, this would be a good method for prioritizing compounds for synthesis in the lab. You save yourself a lot of time and investment actually sending your additional compounds into the lab. So in terms of the development of these methods, so the theoretical foundations were laid kind of from 1930 to 1950, so at those points, we had thermodynamic integration around uh, 1935. Uh, we had the uh, Zwanzig equation around 1950. Between 1950 and 1980, we had some enabling technologies, so development of molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo, molecular mechanics. And from about 1918 onwards, uh, this became the realm of academic research. So the term alchemical was coined in 1984. And now with increasing kind of computational resources and development of the methodology, this is now becoming something <coughs> Which is used in industry, so particularly relative binding energy calculations, <clears throat> but also to an extent absolute, especially as the computational power increases, the more expensive but more general absolute binding energy calculation technique will likely become more commonplace. Uh, so, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, now hopefully that's motivated why you should be interested in these methods. So, now what are they? Why do we use them? And how do we use them? So why can we not just use the kind of naive methodology which is shown on this slide here, which is why don't we just take a box with our protein in blue, our ligand in green, throw the ligand into the box, run molecular dynamics for a while, and then come back and check the proportion of the time that the ligand would bind to the protein and the ligand would <laughs> unbind from the protein. Then we could get the binding constants and we could get the free energy of binding by putting it into this equation up here. So why is this an intractable problem? Well, in order to converge this simulation, you'd have to have enough binding and unbinding events so that you had converged statistics so that it's sampled the bound and unbound states in equilibrium. But imagine if you throw in quite a strong binder, it's likely to bind to your protein and not unbind the entire time scale of the simulation. And even if you have the most powerful molecular dynamic supercomputer in the world, you're not going to be able to run this for long enough to get converged statistics. So we have to come up with a more intelligent way of running the simulations. Uh, next slide, please. So the alternative way of doing this is the alchemical pathway. So what we do here is we take advantage of the fact that Gibbs free energy is a state function. That means we can choose any path we like between the beginning and the end states, add up the terms around the cycle, and this gives us the free energy difference. So what's shown here is the cycle for a relative line of free energy calculation, where we have some ligands here at the top. So we have phenol methanol, and then we have toluene on the bottom. And we want to know here which is the better ligand for this host here. So we want to know the difference between delta G bind B and delta G bind A. So delta G bind B minus delta G bind A is what we call delta delta G bind. And this tells us which is the better ligand for the host here. However, I've just told you that it's computationally intractable to go directly along the bottom or directly along the top. So what we need to do instead is go in these sides here. So what we do is we alchemically interconvert one ligand into the other in solution and in the bind state when bound to the protein. It's called alchemical because we go through unphysical intermediates. And this, it turns out, allows us to converge simulations down these two legs, and we can get delta delta G now, 
as an expression of these two terms here, allowing us to avoid the intractable steps to the top and the bottom. So this is a more efficient way of running simulations. Uh, next slide, please. So I said that we interconvert these two ligands, but how do we do that exactly? So we know the potential energy of the system U is a function of the coordinates of the left of the system X, but now we introduce the dependence of the parameter called lambda. If you look at the expression at the bottom, you can see what this is doing is mixing in two different descriptions of the potential energies. So U0, that describes the potential energy of one end state, and U1 describes the other end state and some unaffected terms. So if lambda is equal to zero, we just have U0 recovered. If lambda is equal to one, we just have U1. And at intermediate values of lambda, we mix in descriptions of the two end states, essentially. You might notice we're not starting completely here from benzene and moving over to phenylmethanol. In fact, we're starting from what we call a merged molecule, where we've added on dummy acids, which have no interactive interactions. They only interact in bonded interactions here. And this allows the engine to know how to interconvert our first molecule into the final molecule. And what happens as we scale up lambda is you can see these dummy atoms start to interact gradually and then turn into, for instance, oxygen or hydrogen. And this hydrogen here on the benzene turns into a carbon. So lambda controls the interconversion of the two species. Uh, next slide, please. So what are these potential energy functions? Well, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the standard functional form of the molecular mechanics force field. But as a recap, so we might have a harmonic term to describe the bond stretching, the same again for the angles. We have a term here for the torsions, where the N describes the frequency. We have a delta, which is an offset. We add one and divide by two, so the minimum of this function is zero and the maximum is the N. We can have improper torsions, where the atoms which define the torsions are not contiguous bonded atoms. And this allows us to do things like enforce the polarity of an aromatic ring. We have the intermolecular interactions. So we have here the Leonard Jones term. So we have an attractive to the power of six term, and this is quite physically uh, well motivated. You can show that the dispersion interactions fall off with one over the power of R to six. And then we have the power of 12 term, which is less physically well motivated. Uh, it turns out it does a reasonable job of approximating the cloudy repulsion, and conveniently, it's the square of the other terms, so it's efficient for computation. Finally, we've got our electrostatics on the right, and we're missing some constants at the front of it. So the functional form and the parameter set are what we call a force field. It's essentially a back function which maps the coordinates of the system to the energy of the system. So commonly used force fields include charm, amber, opiolet. Next slide, please. So I told you that we interconvert using this lambda coordinates, but that was a little bit of a simplification. So it turns out linearly scaling things according to the lambda coordinates works quite well for charges. It's close to optimal. We run into problems when we try and turn off and on Leonard Jones terms with lambda linearly. So, I'm going to show you on the left an example where we linearly scale Leonard Jones interactions. This is just a standard Leonard Jones potential. So, what's happening here is we have an atom which is fully interacting and we want to totally vanish it. We want to turn it to a dummy atom. So, we start up here with a standard Leonard Jones at lambda zero, and that's in blue on the right. And we finish off here with a completely flat potential at lambda equals one. But the issue with linearly scaling the Leonard Jones potential is that even at lambda 0 0.999, we still have a massive repulsive potential here. So effectively what is happening is the Leonard Jones repulsive interaction is suddenly vanishing or suddenly interfering. And you can imagine that this might cause convergence issues. So instead what we want is we want something like this where we can gradually turn off our Leonard Jones potential. And that's why we use what we call a soft core potential. So that's shown up here. You can see at lambda zero, we recover our standard Leonard Jones potential. If lambda is one, we have zero everywhere. And at intermediate values of lambda, what this does is effectively adds to r, it adds to r squared. So you can think of it a little bit of moving this potential to the left. And the effect of this is to completely smooth out the turning on and turning off of the Leonard Jones interaction. Right, next slide, please. So, what can biosome space do for you? So, biosome space can hold merged molecules. So, that's the description of molecules of one end state is one molecule, and another end state is the initial molecule with some additional dummy atoms, for example. And this allows the energy to know how to interconvert the two molecules. So we can hold this and it can write intermediates. Next slide, please. So biosome space can also set up your simulation. It can create a complete directory structure and it can set up all the inputs required, for instance, for SOMB, for Amber, for Gromax. And in these tutorials, we'll be using SOMB and we'll be using Gromax. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, biosome space could analyze your output for you. So what's shown here is a calculation where we're interconverting ethane, methanol, and water. 
what we've done is we've split up lambda into several windows, so five windows. So what we do in equilibrium calculations is we split lambda up into a number of values, the end states and some intermediate values, and then we run some equilibrium simulation in the lambda. So here we run for eight nanoseconds at each. The windows have to be close enough together for our estimation of free energy to be accurate, and that's something you'll look at a little bit in the workshop. So how then can we estimate the free energy from the samples that we've generated with this value of lambda? One, original, or one fairly simple way of doing this is this Wanzing equation, which is shown here. So this is telling us the free energy difference, delta G AB, so that could be between lambda zero and lambda equal to 0 0.25. It's given by this term here. So first of all, we have angle brackets here with A, and that's telling us this is an average over state A. So this means if A zero, we've taken samples from lambda is equal to zero. We've then checked G of these um, samples with the potential energy function at lambda is equal to zero. We've taken the same samples and checked the potential energy at lambda is equal to B, so 0 0.25, and we check the difference between them. And then we can take the average of this exponential term, put it into the equation, and that can give us the energy difference. You might be wondering where's the entropy? We're talking about free energy, but there's only energy here. Well, the entropy effectively comes from the average. So the reason we don't use this in practice is that actually this is quite a noisy and tends to be biased estimator. And the reason for this is if the difference between the two energies here, the standard deviation is large, then because of this exponential, it will be dominated by very few terms. So only a few samples will contribute to the average and we'll get a noisy estimator. So in practice, we don't actually use this. Next slide, please. So what's a better estimator that in fact we do use? Well, thermodynamic integration is implemented in Bison space, or Bison space can do this for you. And what we do here is we take the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to lambda, at each value of lambda, and integrate over lambda. So essentially, based on this graph, the free energy is given by the white area between zero and the line here, so the area under the curve. There's a couple of issues from this. So how do we actually calculate the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to lambda? Well, you can show, in fact, this is equivalent to taking the average value of the partial derivative of potential energy with respect to lambda. And if you want to see derivations of this, check out alchemistry.org. It says the nice simple derivations, please. And then we integrate it to lambda. The second issue is we're not simulating every value of lambda. We're taking windows, we're splitting up into a few lambda windows, and then we're calculating this at every lambda window. So we can't integrate smoothly. We have to use numerical integration to get the answer. And that can introduce um, so next slide, please. So finally, there's the multi-state finite acceptance ratio, which is a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to go into details of how this is described, basically. It can be shown that this is the lowest variance unbiased estimator of free energy, and it is implemented in biospace, and we'll be using it today. To give you a brief idea, hopefully, of what this is. So on the left, we have an exponential of a term, negative fi. I is the huge free energy in some state i. So i is lambda index and reduce it's already been divided by kt so that's why there's no beta or kt in there what we do effectively is we take all the samples we get from all of our lambda windows and we throw them together in one pot so a sample is xn that's the coordinates uh, and the energy of the sample at a given value of lambda is ui brackets xn so if we want to know the free energy of state i imagine that's lambda zero we stick in our samples from all of every single lambda window, that's the sum on the left from n equals one to n. We get the Boltzmann factor for that, that's the state of interest. And then on the bottom, we have a term which looks quite similar, a Boltzmann factor, and then we have the free energy for the state. And the effect of that free energy term there is effectively to normalize. You could split up this exponential into e to the minus uk and e to the plus fk, take the e to the plus fk to the bottom, that gives you configurational integrals. So that's a normalized probability finding the sample xn at the lambda window. And that's on the bottom just a weighted sum of the probabilities of finding the sample at a given lambda state. So you can think about this effectively as this one equation, where instead of sampling for one state, you're sampling from the mixture distribution of all of the states that you've sampled. You might notice that there's free energy on the left and there's free energy on the right. So we need the free energy effectively to get the free energy. And this means we have to solve self-consistently iteratively. So when we do this, we get free energies which are correct up to some additive constant, but we don't care about this because we only care about free energy differences. Oh. So we can just add the terms together to get the tension of main force with respect to lambda. <coughs> but this is showing you how the free energy is changing as we move along the lambda coordinate. 
The final quantity of interest is just the difference between lambda zero and lambda is equal to one. So next slide, please. So finally, it's important to have metrics which tell us how reliable our estimators for energy are likely to be. When we're using an estimator which depends on phase phase overlap, for instance, MBAR, the overlap matrix is something which is very useful to check that we'll be checking during the tutorials. So this gives us an estimate of the phase space overlap. So looking briefly at the math, maths, what we do is we define a weight matrix, which contains the weight of the sample here, and an element of it shown here. So Xn is just a sample again. The term on the top amounts to the probability of finding the sample at the lambda window of i. Then on the bottom, we have a weighted sum of finding it at all the other lambda windows, so sum up to k. So here, k is eight, we have eight lambda windows. It turns out if you combine them in the way shown, we get our overlap matrix. And the important thing to remember from this is that you can interpret this as the element OJ is the probability of a sample being generated at J being observed in state I. And what is practically important for your simulations is to look at the off diagonal elements of this overlap matrix. Because what you want is good overlap between adjacent states, your estimates are accurate, but you don't want too much. You don't want overlap in kind of far away states because then you run too many simulations and you've wasted simulation time. So how much overlap is enough overlap? That's a bit of a gray area, but generally we go with significantly greater than 0.03 is a rough rule of thumb. And you would 